This videotape will introduce you to the principles of flight and explain how heavier than air objects are able to fly. You will be shown the physics principles which make flight possible, the effect of the atmosphere on flight, the four main forces that influence flight, equilibrium, and stability. Much of what we deal with in this program is based on Newton's third law of motion. Simply put, it states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. How does this apply to an airplane? As a propeller moves a mass of air backwards, there is an equal force that moves the plane forward. This is called thrust. More about that when the four forces of flight are discussed. First, we will consider the atmosphere and changes in its properties that affect flight. Two properties we concern ourselves with are density and pressure. Density refers to the mass or weight of the air in a given volume. Changes in that density are measured as air pressure. At sea level, air pressure averages about 14.7 pounds per square inch. Barometric pressure may also be measured in inches of mercury. The pressure at sea level is the pressure required to raise mercury in a barometer to a height of 29.92 inches. As altitude increases, air pressure decreases. Looking at the two columns of air, one at sea level and the other at 10,000 feet, notice the column at 10,000 feet has less air in it therefore less density and a lower air pressure. As a matter of fact, the air pressure at 10,000 feet is 10.2 pounds or a drop of 4.5 pounds. Before we leave the subject of the atmosphere, we'll consider one other factor, temperature. As altitude increases, temperature drops. The reason for this is that the sun's heat has little effect on air. Most of its energy is absorbed by the Earth, making the Earth the nearest heat source to the air. Therefore, air closest to the Earth is warmer. Air higher up is cooler. We'll now consider the four main forces that influence flight. We've already mentioned thrust. The others include drag, weight, and lift. Note how Newton's third law comes into play. Thrust and drag are opposite forces, as are lift and weight. First, we'll discuss lift and weight, the two vertical forces that act on a plane. Weight, the downward force, is the total weight of the plane and its contents. For the purposes of this discussion, it is calculated through a single point known as the center of gravity. Lift, the upward force, is generated as the aircraft is thrust through the air. As the wing of the plane travels through the atmosphere, the air above the wing is traveling faster than the air below it. The principle at work here is Bernoulli's theorem. It states that as the velocity of air increases, its pressure decreases. Since the air above the wing is moving faster, the pressure above the wing is lower. The effect of the decreased pressure above the wing is obvious. And when the lift force becomes greater than the plane's weight, flight is the result. Like weight, the lift is calculated through a single point. It is located on the wing and is called the center of pressure. There are several observations we can make about lift, but first some definitions. Relative airflow is always parallel to and opposite the flight path of the aircraft. The angle of incidence is measured between the plane of the wing cord and the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. The angle of attack is the angle between the wing cord and the relative airflow. Let's go back to Bernoulli's theorem for a moment. Remembering the pressure on the top surface of the wing is less than that underneath. Detailed tests have also revealed the pressures are not evenly distributed. The lower pressure on the top surface and the higher pressure underneath are greatest over the front of the wing. The center of pressure is calculated by deriving a single resultant force. 
the center of pressure moves forward as the angle of attack increases. This will continue until it reaches an acute angle, well beyond ordinary flight angles, when it will move back again. If the center of pressure moves far enough back, the nose of the aircraft will suddenly pitch downwards as the wing enters a stalled condition. The thin layer of air that flows over the wing is called the boundary layer. This has two parts, the laminar layer and the undesirable turbulent layer. As air flows over the wing, it conforms to its shape. This is the very thin laminar layer. Between the leading and trailing edges of the wing, there is a point of transition where the boundary layer starts to become thick and increasingly turbulent. This is the turbulent layer. Wings have been designed to maintain a laminar flow over as much of the wing surface as possible. The laminar flow type wing is generally thinner than conventional wings and the leading edge more pointed. The section is nearly symmetrical and the point of maximum camber or greatest convexity is further back than on conventional wings. This design results in more even pressure distribution since the airflow is speeded up gradually from the leading edge to the point of maximum camber. Note, as the laminar wing approaches stalling speed, the transition point moves forward more rapidly than on a conventional wing. We'll now deal with the other two main forces affecting flight, thrust and drag. In level flight, thrust and drag are the two horizontal forces acting on the aircraft. Thrust, the forward motion, is provided by the aircraft's propeller. Drag results from the resistance to the aircraft passing through the air. We'll consider four types of drag. The first, form drag, is caused by the shape of the aircraft. It can be reduced by a more streamlined design. Skin friction drag results from air resistance to the surface of the aircraft. Smooth, highly polished surfaces have less skin friction. Moderate ice on the aircraft surface increases skin friction drag. Induced drag is a result of lift. High pressure air from under the wing flows to the lower pressure area above the wing, creating a rotary motion at the wingtips. This airflow is known as wingtip vortices. This disturbed air causes induced drag. Induced drag is also influenced by the aspect ratio. This is the ratio of the wingspan to the mean cord. The higher the aspect ratio, the lower the induced drag. Finally, the fourth type of drag is called parasitic drag. This is caused by wheels, struts, radio masts, and other external attachments to the plane that create resistance to airflow. Two other forces that affect flight are torque and slipstream. Torque results from the twisting action produced by the plane's engine. In response to Newton's third law, as the engine rotates the propeller in one direction, the plane tries to rotate in the opposite direction. Most North American planes have a propeller that rotates clockwise when viewed from the cockpit. To overcome torque, the left wing is given a slightly higher angle of incidence, and therefore slightly more lift than the right wing. Slipstream is the mass of air pushed backwards by the propeller. As this air moves back, it strikes the fin or rudder of the aircraft, pushing it to the right. This affects the directional and lateral balance of the aircraft and is compensated for by offsetting the fin for normal cruising flight. This balance, of course, will be upset when engine power is changed. We now move to the concept of equilibrium. This is a state in which an object is neither accelerating nor decelerating. Examples would be a parked aircraft, an aircraft in straight and level flight at a constant speed, or an aircraft climbing or descending at a constant speed. A plane in a turn at constant height and airspeed, however, is not in equilibrium. That is because during a turning motion, the plane is always accelerating towards the center of the turn. 
There are ways to alter a plane's equilibrium. Roll, or movement about the plane's longitudinal axis, is controlled by the ailerons. When an aircraft is rolled, one aileron is depressed and the opposite one is raised. This down aileron increases the camber of the wing, giving it more lift, pushing that wing up. Conversely, the up aileron reduces the camber and the effective lift, which accentuates the roll around the longitudinal axis. The ailerons are controlled by the left and right movement of the plane's control column. When the control column is moved to the left, the left aileron is raised and vice versa. Pitching is movement of the aircraft around the lateral axis and is controlled by the elevators. Backward movement of the control column raises the elevators, producing a force that causes the nose to rise and the tail to go down. Forward movement of the control column produces the opposite effect. Yaw is the movement around the vertical axis and is controlled by the rudder, which is hinged to the fin or vertical stabilizer of the aircraft. Foot pressure on the left rudder pedal causes the rudder to move to the left. This increases the camber of the fin, causing a mass of air to flow to the left. The result is the tail of the plane moves right while the nose moves to the left. Using the right rudder pedal produces the opposite effect. Aileron drag or adverse yaw occurs when the ailerons are used. For example, during a turn, the down aileron is subjected to more induced drag as a result of the increased camber. This causes a momentary yaw opposite the direction of the turn. It usually occurs in a sudden uncoordinated control movement. Smooth, well-coordinated turns will avoid this effect. There are other devices to help the pilot control the plane. They include trim tab, flaps, and slots and slats. Trim tabs improve the control and balance of an aircraft and are small auxiliary control surfaces attached to the trailing edges of ailerons, elevators, and the rudder. They may be fixed or hinged. Fixed trim tabs are preset on the ground. Hinged tabs are controlled by the pilot. In larger aircraft, hinged tabs are fitted to all control surfaces to compensate for lateral shifts in loading. They also provide better rudder control in the event of engine failure in a multi-engine aircraft. Flaps are controlled by the pilot and improve lift by increasing the camber of a large portion of the wing. Flaps offer the pilot other advantages such as a decreased stalling speed and a shorter takeoff run. They also allow a steeper approach to landing without an increase in airspeed and forward visibility is improved on approach to landing due to the lower nose position. When the pilot sets a flap position, both flaps go up or down together. When fully retracted, flaps conform to the shape of the wing. Flaps must be used cautiously, especially when near the ground because of the sudden loss of lift and change in the plane's balance that can result. There are several types of flaps, plane, slotted, split, zap, the fowler flap, double slotted, and double slotted flap and leading edge slat. Slots and slats are devices on the leading edge of the wing which improve the airflow or laminar layer of air over the wing at low speeds. These may be fixed or controlled by the pilot and are generally found on airplanes with special performance requirements. On some aircraft, the tailplane can be varied in flight to trim the aircraft longitudinally. This is done with a horizontal stabilizer and the effect is similar to trimming the elevators on an aircraft with a fixed tailplane. If the plane has differential brakes, that is an independent braking system for each main landing wheel, they may be used to shorten a landing roll or give directional control on the ground. Pressure applied to the left brake pedal slows the left wheel and turns the airplane to the left, and vice versa. To stop straight, equal pressure must be applied to both brake pedals. One last effect we'll discuss in this section is the gyroscopic effect. 
a spinning gyro will remain rigid in space even though the platform it is pivoted on changes its attitude. This is the principle upon which the attitude indicator and heading indicator is based. But the gyroscopic effect also has an effect on an aircraft in flight. The spinning aircraft engine and propeller act as a gyro wheel and try to remain rigid in space. They are also susceptible to gyroscopic precession. This occurs when a force is applied to a spinning object. The object will react as though the force had been applied at a point 90 degrees from where it was actually applied. This effect can be quite noticeable on a tailwheel equipped aircraft because when the tail raises, the propeller is pushed forward. And because of gyroscopic precession, the aircraft yaws to the left. The final section of this tape deals with stability. An aircraft is considered to be stable when it returns to its original position after being subjected to an air disturbance such as an updraft. You recall we showed the three planes of rotation of an aircraft, pitching or lateral movement, yawing or vertical movement, and rolling or longitudinal movement. Stability in an aircraft is achieved through its design. Lateral stability can be achieved by using a dihedral design. In this feature, the wing tips are higher than the center section of the wing. This causes turbulent air to move to the down wing, exposing it to more airflow than the up wing. Because the down wing also has a higher angle of attack, it produces more lift and the aircraft returns to a level state. Directional stability controls the yawing motion of the aircraft. The vertical stabilizer contributes to the directional stability of an airplane. Longitudinal stability is perhaps the most critical characteristic of an aircraft. It is affected by aerodynamic and physical factors, including human error. The greatest influence on longitudinal stability is the center of gravity. Other factors that influence it are changes of speed, power, and attitude. Turbulent air, operation of the flaps, and other controls can also affect longitudinal stability. This problem is primarily resolved by the horizontal stabilizer and aided by the vertical stabilizer. Because these stabilizers are a long way from the center of gravity of the aircraft, they have a great leverage. Even a small force on them produces a large correcting movement. The basic center of gravity of an aircraft is calculated for an empty plane. Obviously, the center of gravity will change according to how the plane is loaded. It is the responsibility of the pilot to make sure the center of gravity remains within the tolerances set out in the weight and balance report. You can seriously affect the controllability of a plane by improperly loading it. To simplify loading problems, most manufacturers of light aircraft provide pre-calculated graphs, charts, or loading examples. Careless aft loading can lead to serious balance and control problems, even if the maximum permissible weight is not exceeded. Factors you must consider when calculating the center of gravity include the weight of the fuel, pilot, passengers, baggage, and other payload. 